Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Je m'appelle Stéphane Molyneux, and I'm going to do the rest of this in English. Sorry for the tease, my French is not quite good enough for this kind of uh, presentation. But we're going to be talking about the French elections coming up uh, in, I guess, a relatively short while. The most important elections, I believe, in the history of France, certainly in the history of the French Republic. It really comes down to one issue as was the case with the American election. It comes down to one issue and one issue only. Now, this issue is something that is whispered about. It is something that is talked about surreptitiously, under the covers, in the dark, with great caution. And we are going to bring you as many facts as possible about the question of immigration, cultural assimilation within France. This is the big issue. The French Prime Minister... Manuel Valls, said on July 17, 2016, Terrorism will be a part of our daily lives for a long time. Let's be clear, times have changed. That is really an astonishing statement. Terrorism will be part of our daily lives for a long time. Let's be clear, times have changed. Why? Why? Japan isn't taking... People from uh, Africa, people from the third world, and they're not having any terrorist attacks. Why is it, uh, it's not like the tide coming in or going out or the weather changing. These are all the result of very specific political decisions which are open to review in a democratic society. Why is it, well, times have changed, things are different. No, make choices, make choices, damn it. April 23rd, 2017, France will halt a presidential election and the top two vote getters will head to the final presidential runoff on May 7th. National Front leader Marine Le Pen, independent candidate Emmanuel Macron, the Socialist Party's Benoit Hamon, Left Party's Jean-Luc Mélenchon, and Conservative candidate François Fillon have been embroiled in a close election race, racked with scandal, and the future of France is currently on the line. So... Like with the most of the recent elections, the topic of immigration and the European migrant crisis remains the most crucial campaign issue. What is happening statistically, demographically in France with regards to immigration? Well, the short answer is I wish I could tell you. And this, to me, is sinister enough to really give anybody pause. So racial and ethnic censuses have been banned by the French government since 1978. There's a story, oh, it sounds like Nazi Germany and so on, to have any kind of demographic information about race, ethnicity, and so on. But this is important. You know, in, in Mexico, there's something in the Constitution which says you're not allowed to change the demographics of Mexico. You can't. It's got to stay Mexican, got to stay Hispanic. Got to. And... Your country is kind of being voted out from under your feet in many ways. And you need information in order to be able to make intelligent decisions as a voter, as somebody who can pull that lever and change the course of your country. So the fact that you have a government that is continually refusing to get the information and provide you the information that you need in order to make better decisions about the future of your country is pretty telling. So we can't, like, I cannot include statistics on crime or welfare consumption by ethnicity because that information is uh, not released. It's not allowed. But I can tell you this, and I think everybody will appreciate this and understand this. I can tell you this. If the news were good, you would have had it by now. The fact that this information is not available is not reassuring at all to people who want this information so they can make better decisions. And it tells you everything you need to know about this information when you understand why it's kept from you. It's because the information is most likely terrible. But there's some things we can figure out. So let's dive in. What is the population of France? So this is estimated and projected. I think mean, French law prohibits the collection of official statistics about the race or religion of its citizens. The estimation in uh, France is that the Muslim population uh, is at about 6.5 million people. So in real terms, France does have the largest Muslim population in Europe, uh, in the European Union. So the total population, just short of 67 million. 
7.2 million foreign born, 6.5 uh, Muslim. Now there are various estimates and this is why this election, as I think I have mentioned and which I will continue to mention, there are some various estimates and we'll put sources to everything that I'm talking about uh, in the description uh, of this uh, video and of this uh, podcast. The Muslim population in France is estimated to a double, to, to over 12 million by 2020, 2025. Now, when I was a kid, this seemed like science fiction dates. 2020, of course, three years away. 2025 is uh, eight years away. Uh, 12 million Muslim population will double, right? according to some estimates, within just a few years. So this is back from 1999 all the way through to 2013, which is the latest information uh, that is available. This is the foreign-born population uh, in, um, uh, in France, uh, as you can see. Uh, it uh, started off at about 7% or so, and now is uh, just a little bit over uh, 12%. And uh, these trends continue to uh, accelerate. Right. If you've heard that old story about, you know, the guy who went to the king and uh, he said, well, you know, you put one grain on um, his king says, well, what do you want for a particular service? The guy says, well, put one grain on one piece of a chessboard, then put two, then four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256. And you kind of go up from there. And, um, you know, by the time he got to the bottom of the chessboard, he owned all the grain in the kingdom. So this has a multiplier effect over time. So the population projections going forward to 2080, uh, we go from, from 2010, uh, 64,677,000. We're going up to 78,842,000 by 2080. So we've got an expected increase of uh, just over 14 million uh, people uh, over the next, um, I guess, uh, 60 uh, odd years. So here we're talking about this potential displacement over time. This is annual births by parent nationality, the nationality of the parents from 1965 to 2015. Hey, it's kind of like me two years ago, but anyway. Um, so the French parents, you can see here, uh, this is declining over time. And here you can see at the bottom, the yellow line, one foreign parent has gone up uh, enormously. Uh, and uh, uh, two foreign parents uh, is uh, kind of going in and around the uh, the middle. So you can see here there's quite a dip and going up there is, uh, this is births, right? So here we can see that um, it's, you know, 600,000 to French parents and over 100,000 uh, to one foreign parent and uh, maybe 60, 70,000 to foreign parents as a whole. So it's becoming a significant portion of the population. Immigrants by country of origin. This is again as of 2013 the most recent information. Number one, Algeria, 759,757. Morocco, just one over 709,000. Portugal, 606,000 and change. Italy, 288,000 and change. Tunisia, 258,597. Turkey, 248,616. Spain, 245,104. Other Asian countries, 206,881. Other African countries, 186,884. And the United Kingdom, 150,232. Let's just put it this way. This is not exactly balanced out by the Jews fleeing France for reasons we'll get to in a few moments. Births by parent nationality, 2015, a French parent, 77.2% of births, one foreign parent, 14.2% of um, uh, births, and foreign parents, 8.6% of births. So in the I guess you can be happy, at least you're not Germany, kind of graph. Uh, this is asylum applications by country, 2000 to uh, 2016. As you can see here, Germany, it's gone completely uh, mental. Remember, Angela Merkel said that multiculturalism doesn't work. I wonder what they have on her, <laughs> that she's continuing down this path. It's absolutely astounding. And uh, Sweden, uh, as you can see, went pretty mental in 2015 uh, at 150,000 uh, and change 
Uh, Germany clocked in at just under half a million in a single year. This data actually, remember, tracks only first-time asylum applications. This is not reapplications by the same people. And uh, France, here you can see here in the purple, uh, is, um, well, now it's second, second highest. Um, obviously, still significantly below um, Germany, but uh, France is, is, is second highest. Now, the French data is provisional. The final data, huh, you won't believe this timing. The final data will be available in May 2016. Um, coincidentally, that's, that's after the election, but maybe, maybe that's just a coincidence. No, no, it's not a coincidence, I'm sure. So from 2000 to 2016, Germany took in 1,884,295, right? Again, first time, not counting reapplications. France, a little over 900,000. 900,000. And of course, given how many of those uh, are on welfare, taking government programs and, and so on, uh, that is a huge burden on the French taxpayer. For what benefit? I don't know, maybe it'll come to me. The United Kingdom took just under 700,000. Sweden, 687,105. Per capita, I think they're winning. And Spain, just under 110,000. Fertility rates by religion. Um, it's important to be able to count this way. Uh, in Europe as a whole, non-Muslims have 1.5 fertility rates. So you need 2.1 uh, to maintain a balance uh, of your population. And this is one of the great enraging horror shows of propaganda that has occurred over the past half century or so, in that, in general, Europeans, white Europeans and so on, uh, have been told, too many people on the planet don't have children, too many people on the planet don't have children, uh, at the same time that Europeans uh, were voting for these massive social programs that can only be sustained by new taxpayers. See, you can't, you can't have both people. You understand that. If you want a big welfare state, especially if you want old age pensions, you have to have young taxpayers. So if you want all these goodies, all this free stuff, but you don't have any children, you're doomed, right? So everyone was said in the West, don't have kids, don't have kids. And now, boom, sorry, as the meme goes, you know, your, 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 your grandmother had 10 kids. Your great-grandmother had 12 children. Your grandmother had six children. Your mother had two children. You have an abortion and a dog. Oh, that's the way it works. They said, don't have children, don't have children. And a lot of people believe them. And now... Oh, sorry, now we need to import all these people from the third world because you, there's just not enough people in the country. <sighs> I must maintain my moment of zen. This is a horrifying stuff. So Europe is below replacement uh, levels. And of course, the way that it, it should work is when you're below replacement levels, it should be cheaper for you to have children, which means that you're going to have more children, but because of the welfare state, old age pensions, military industrial complexes, and now uh, the migrant crisis and other forms of immigration, um, Europe is at 1.5. Uh, Muslims uh, as a whole, uh, 2.1. Uh, that is in Europe. In North America, non-Muslims are at uh, 2. Uh, so, so good job, Mormons. <laughs> Uh, and uh, Muslims are at 2.6. Asia Pacific, 2.0. Muslims at 2.7. Middle East, non-Muslims at 2.6. Muslims at 3.0. And Sub-Saharan Africa says, thanks so much for all that free food and foreign aid. Non-Muslims are at 4.5. Fertility rate, right? 4.5 children per couple. And the Muslims in Sub-Saharan Africa, 5.6 children per, per couple. So... See, it's this pathological altruism. Let's just take lots of resources from the West and give it to the third world. And the West can't afford to have kids, but the third world is having kids like crazy. And, and then math. How's unemployment uh, doing, right? Because remember, there's this whole story that you see the immigrants come in to do, do, do all this work, right? That's, they're going to they're gonna do the work. Well, uh, statistically, uh, no, right? Native-born unemployment rate uh, in uh, France since 2000 has been cooking around 8%. A foreign-born unemployment rate, well, 16%, 12%. Now it's back over 
uh, 16%. The most recent figures are that native-born unemployment rate at 9.5%. This is out of 2015. Foreign-born unemployment rate, 17.4%. Now, I'm going to go out on a very shaky statistical limb and say I really don't believe these numbers at all. Um, I think that the foreign-born unemployment rate is most likely much higher. I would also assume the native-born unemployment rate is much higher as well because I don't know how it works in France. It's tough to get all of the details, but uh, I certainly know in um, America, for instance, if you give up looking for work, they don't think you're unemployed anymore. Um, I don't know. <laughs> it's like counting the dead among the living, but uh, that's the way it works. So, But of course, for politicians... Uh, particularly politicians on the left, which in Europe is mostly politicians. <laughs> but for politicians, if you bring in people who you can tax productive citizens to pay for bringing them in, and they're going to vote for you over time because they're from the third world, so they're going to vote left in general, well, that's a good deal. You get political power. Now, if you're going to try and convince your Domestic population to have children, well, they tried this in Italy and all the feminists screeched at them like uh, demented harpies, but, I mean, that's sort of redundant. And, um, you yeah, oh, we're just breeding cattle, you know? It's like, oh, yeah, because women never look at men as just wallets on legs. But um, uh, so if you try and convince your domestic population to breed, then as a politician, you end up with a lot of costs, right? Because the women don't work while they're uh, taking care of their kids. And, you know, of course, there's lots of generous maternity benefits in Europe. So you've got to pay for that out of the public purse. Women aren't contributing in taxes. You've got to pay for teachers. You've got to pay for health care for kids. You've got to pay for schools. You've got to pay for all these kinds of things. So it's a huge net loss. Uh, children for a society uh, until they grow up and become taxpayers long after the existing crop of politicians, at least those at the top have long retired and probably died. So they have no interest in doing that. But if they can tax the population, import a bunch of people to vote for them, you know, pretty quickly, that's a good deal. Uh, plus, of course, they get to attack the right by screeching uh, racism epithets at them every time they question uh, some of the demographics and potential cultural incompatibilities uh, of, um, of, of everyone coming in. It's not just one big blob. I mean, you bring in people from Afghanistan, how are they going to get along with people from Somalia? And how are those people from Somalia going to get along with the people from other places in Africa? I mean, it's not just... Anyway, you understand. So just show me a place where it's worked in the past and I'll be happy to reconsider. But if you look up, you can Google this, Robert Putnam, P-U-T-N-A-M, Robert Putnam, his research into, he's a kind of a liberal and, and he sat on his research for years. He didn't want to publish it. His research conclusively shows how disastrous uh, multiculturalism and diversity is for uh, communities, for trust, for success, for neighborliness and all that kind of stuff. It's uh doesn't doesn't work. Labor participation, 2000 to 2015. Na uh, Native-born labor participation rate has been uh, climbing, right? And no particular interruption, even during the financial crisis that started uh, in um, 2007, 2008. Going from, you know, 68, 69% to all the way up to 72%. It's currently cooking, or at least was as of 2015, at 71.9%. And the foreign-born labor participation rate is significantly uh, below this kind of stuff, right? I mean, so uh, right now it's 66.9%. Again, how accurate all of this stuff is, I don't know, but we don't have any better data, so this is what we have. It's still, uh, it's still telling enough. And as you can see, from 2013 onwards, they're diverging, and the foreign-born labor participation rate is, uh, in fact, uh, going, uh, going down. Radicalization is uh, a, a big problem. Um, one of the things that has been predicted by a number of guests that have been on uh, my show, and, and there's lots of good explanations for it, I'll leave you to research that yourself, but the second generation um, of uh, immigrants from foreign cultures uh, often tends to be a little more radical than the first generation. See, that's not how the theory is supposed to go. The theory is supposed to go, well, there's adjustments with the first generation, but the second generation, tickety-boo, they're going to slip in, they're going to be in like Flynn, and they're going to just absorb and, and become part of the culture and all that, uh, except, uh, no. Uh, no, that is uh, not uh, not happening. Uh, and, uh, in fact, it's moving uh, the, the other way uh, in many cases. The French government currently has over 15,000 people, including about 2,000 children, on an Islamic radical 
a, a watch list. So that seems that seems quite important. An estimated 4,000 of these individuals are tracked daily and are considered to be at the top of the spectrum in terms of danger posed to the French population. To show the extent of the radicalization, a confidential Paris police memo showed that 17 Muslim police officers were investigated for Islamic radicalization between 2012 and 2015. Well, uh, that's uh, important. And of course, a number of radicals uh, from all ethnicities and religions that uh, may be being trained in the military is not inconsiderable as well. 17 Muslim police officers investigated for Islamic radicalization between 2012 and 2015. These officers refused to protect Jewish synagogues and even discussed committing terrorist attacks on social media. Huh. Now, admittedly, I'm not a professional detective. However, I don't get the feeling that this would be a particularly long investigation because... You know, if you've got 17 police officers discussing committing terrorist attacks on social media, isn't that kind of the end of your investigation? I don't know. We'll see. In May 2016, Prime Minister Manuel Valls released a plan to build 13 de-radicalization centers with the goal of de-radicalizing potential terrorists. With a maximum occupancy of 25 individuals per center, these 13 de-radicalization centers were slated to cost taxpayers over 40 million euros. Huh. So they got 15,000 people on an Islamic radical watch list. They can build 13 of these centers, 25 individuals. I got to tell you, I, I think there's more water going in the bathtub than you're scooping out of the bathtub. Just my, my thought. How's this going? According to French government sociologist Gérald Brunet, he said, it means that you can take an idea or a belief out of the brain? And I think that's just impossible. Nobody in the history of psychology, nobody has succeeded. He says, what we have to try is not a kind of mental manipulation, but the opposite, mind liberation, a strengthening of their intellectual immune systems. And it's they who will have to do that themselves. Okay. <laughs> Not very philosophical, but he's a sociologist, so it's only make-believe. So under the best circumstances, the government, uh, French government hoped to have 3,600 radicalized individuals make use of these facilities within the next two years. So, because not having them come to the country in the first place apparently is completely impossible. I shouldn't laugh, I'm sorry. So, September 2016, France opened its first de radicalization center, and months later, it remains empty after its previous resident. That single. Singular, resident, after its previous resident, was sent to prison for committing violence. So, yeah, turn, turns out the inoculation of a weak-willed leftist indoctrination center uh, is not particularly uh, taking. Some 9,300 people in France are believed to have been radicalized, including many who traveled to the Middle East to fight on behalf of the Islamic State and are now returning to the country. Fabien Clair, who took credit for the Paris Bataclan theater attack that killed 90 and who masterminded the Brussels airport bombings that killed 32 people, was known for recruiting inmates while serving a 2009 to 2014 prison term in France. This fellow was writing letters from prison to Mohamed Mera, who killed three soldiers, a professor and three children in a Jewish school. See, here's the challenge. What are you going to do? You catch these guys, you put them in prison, and they radicalize other people in prison. Ah, I think that their radicalization centers called prisons are somewhat outstripping your de-radicalization centers called empty. Prison population in France. Hey, while we're on the subject. Now, 
this is, of course, uh, a, a challenge, right? So it's illegal to count the number of Muslim prisoners because facts apparently are problematic. So with some prisons like those near Paris and Marseille, um, there's actually a, a higher percentage, most uh, likely. Conversion and radical radicalization while in prison is also a significant concern. Uh, according to the Ministry of Justice, there are 68,500 inmates in an overcrowded prison system with a designated capacity of only 54,600. So despite making up about 10% of the population, Muslims account for an estimated 60 to 70% of inmates in France's prisons, right? So you've got total prisoners, uh, 68,500. Uh, the Muslim prisoners are estimated at uh, 45,850. Other prisoners at uh, 22,650. All of this results from particular choices in politics, which are always open to change. Proportion. Now, this is, we had to go to the Netherlands, and I'm sorry for this. It's not perfect. It's not a direct one-to-one -one correlation, but it may give you a sense of the scale in the Netherlands where there are more facts and, and more information. So proportion of crime suspects by background in 2015. Uh, native Dutch, 0.8%. Huh, pretty, pretty low, right? Uh, in uh, Westerners as a whole, 1.2%. Non-Westerners, 3.2%. Turkish, 2.5%. Surinamese, 3.4%. Moroccan, 4.6%. Antillian, 5.1%. So what this means is that individuals with a Moroccan or Antillian background are almost six times more likely to be suspected of a crime compared to the native Dutch. See, <laughs> I mean, these numbers are, 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 are staggering. 40% of Moroccan immigrants in the Netherlands between the ages of 12 and 24 have been arrested or fined or charged or otherwise accused of committing a crime during the past five years. 40% of Moroccan immigrants between the ages of 12 to 24. This is why when Geert Wilder says, you know, maybe we can have fewer Moroccans around uh, in the long run, um, he's, he's getting some traction with the voters because they can count and they have eyes and they have friends and they read the newspapers and... I mean, I know in France this information is suppressed. Suppressed. It's illegal to get basic information about your safety in France. But where this information is available, it's quite telling. In some Dutch neighborhoods where the majority of residents are Moroccan immigrants, the youth crime rate reaches 50%. See, and, and those are just the ones who are caught, you see. Uh, girls and young women, it's not just males, girls and young women increasingly becoming involved in criminal activities. Now, According to the Dutch Moroccan Monitor, uh, as of 2011, most of the Moroccan youths who were involved in criminal activities were actually born in Holland. Born in Holland. It's all over. Going to these schools, the Netherlands schools, they're part of the culture, they're supposed to be integrated. They're going the other way. Regression to the mean. So, crime rates are increasing as the generations progress in terms of immigration. And no, it's not because of bigotry, it's not because of racism, it's not because of hostility. There are many, many other reasons, because it's not like the countries that they come from are peaceful either. <sighs> so yeah, the Netherlands is paying dearly. Well, the politicians are doing well, and the leftists uh, who hate uh, existing Western society are doing well. But the children, really, in the Netherlands are the ones who are going to have to grow up and deal with these kinds of problems. And they didn't have a choice. They didn't have a say in the matter. They weren't able to vote. So it's not fair. Uh, in the Netherlands, uh, how, um, how are the first and second generations doing? Proportion of crime suspects by generation. So among Westerners, it's pretty flat. Right? Remember the Dutch native population, 0.8% of this proportion of crime suspects. Westerns, 1.15, first generation, 1.16, second generation. Among non-Westerners, 2.41% first generation, 4.54% second generation, almost doubling, second generation. Turkish, 1.7 goes to 3.62. Surinamese, 
2.72 goes to 4.41%. Moroccan, 2.52% first generation, 7.36% second generation. Antillians go down slightly from 5.34 to 4.53, and others go from just over 2% to just under 3%, all much larger than the Dutch natives. These are facts. And again, I'm going to make a blanket case, not proven, hypothetical, but there are some reasons to believe it may be true, that these numbers are too low. Because the police are under pressure to not book a lot of foreign-born people, not book a lot of blacks, not book a lot of people from the third world because they don't want to appear racist. And in the Netherlands, as in lots of places in Europe, if a local is attacked by an immigrant, a, a, a black immigrant or a foreign uh, immigrant is identifiable, they oftentimes won't bother going to the police because the police will, oh, he disappeared into a no-go zone. We can't do anything about it. So uh, could be much, much higher. Now, I originally wanted to do this presentation from the founding of the Republic until now, number of cars torched on New Year's Eve. Pretty low, you know, for the first, I don't know, long while. Then it kind of seems to spike up just a little bit. We couldn't get any numbers further back from 2015. Uh, and this is a 700-based uh, y-axis. So, uh, you yeah, know, the car burnings are now commonplace in France. They started off in the 1990s, you know, in the city's high immigrant districts. And this tradition has now expanded. It's uh, on New Year's Eve uh, you know, rival Muslim gangs compete with each other for the media spotlight over who can cause the most destruction. Uh, an estimated, oh, man alive, an estimated 40,000 cars are burned in France every year. Leading a whole bunch of Keynesian economists to go, yay, we're stimulating car production. 40,000 cars burned. In your country, every year. 2015, New Year's Eve, 940 cars burnt. 2016, oh, it's okay. We went down to 804. Ooh, but you see 2017, a bit more of a celebration. 945 cars torched in France in one night. You know what they say about people who start off by burning books? Always end up by burning people. Seems to ring a bell for me. European Union terrorist attacks. Europol report as of 2015. The United Kingdom, 211. France, 73. Spain, 25. Italy, 4. Greece, 4. Denmark, 2. Hey, Japan. Still zero. Anyone screaming at Japan for not taking migrants? Nope. Interesting. It's almost like if you're confident, they won't bother you. Anyway. European Union terrorist related attacks. Most arrests in 2015. Most arrests in 2015. Ah. <sighs> France leading the way at 424 terrorist-related arrests. Spain, 187. United Kingdom, 134. Belgium, 61. Austria, 49. Ireland, 41. Germany, 40. Italy, 40. Greece, 29. Bulgaria, 21. Um, 11. Netherlands, uh, 20 arrests in 2015. This is from Europol's EU, EU Terrorism Situation and Trend Report. All of these result from specific political choices that can be changed. Nothing is inevitable. Well, unless you think it is, in which case, guess what? You've just made yourself a self-fulfilling prophecy, so start digging. This is from Pew Research as of 2007. Muslim support for suicide bombing. Now, see here, this is a kind of um, uh, test as to compatibility with host cultures. Um, I love France. Love France. Uh, my family background, Molyneux, is French, and I've spent time in France. Wonderful place. And um, had lots of spirited debates with uh, French people. Um, suicide bombing didn't 
didn't really come up at all um, as part of how people could resolve differences uh, in, in the world. But uh, let's look at um, in France. 35% uh, of Muslims as a whole support um, suicide bombing. Among those who are 18 to 29, a lot of those, of course, in the second or third generation, it's 42%. Wait, are we going the right way or the wrong way? I'll let you puzzle this out. In Spain, 25% of Muslims support suicide bombing. 29% of 18 to 29-year-olds support suicide bombing in Great Britain. All 24%, 18 to 29, 35%. Germany, 13% to 22%. United States, 13% to 26%. Now, don't get me wrong. The way that... I've got a whole presentation on this channel called Iraq, a Decade of Hell. What, what has happened? I mean, look at the 13 countries that Obama has bombed relentlessly over the course of his presidency. 100,000 bombs dropped on Muslim countries over the course of his presidency. What has happened to the Muslim countries from the Western governments has been absolutely atrocious, uh, heinously evil, the unraveling and destruction of entire societies. When you look at Iraq, when you look at Afghanistan, when you look at Libya, when you look at Syria, these are horrendous crimes. But guess what? That means you're at war. Sorry, it's just the reality. If you're bombing people, you're this invade everyone, invite everyone. How is this going to work? It can't. Stop bombing people. Because you see what happens now with the internet is you have the welfare state creating this moat around communities so they don't have to integrate. And you have the internet. You know, when I was a kid, um, my mother was an immigrant into uh, England. And she had to wait, I don't know, like two weeks for the German newspapers to be available. And, and so, it, but this kind of now, it's like it's got YouTube, Facebook, videos. <laughs> You're right there. You're right there. And the images and the information being consumed by young people around the world are not what older people think it is. So this kind of radicalization, as you can see, I can kind of understand why some of this is occurring. It, the West's failure to admit, well, to stop the wars, which is what it damn well should have done, or to at least admit that it is at war, this denial, yeah, we're going to bomb these countries and invite hundreds of thousands of young men from these countries. So if we look at these numbers, and this is not perfect, or it's not accounting for children and all that, but let's just roughly go. So you've got 6.5 million Muslims in France. It means over... Two million of them support suicide bombing. Institut Montaigne, 2016 survey. 29% of French Muslims believe Sharia is, quote, more important than the laws of France. Positive attitudes towards uh, ISIS. Well, in France, 18 to 24, well, there's a 27%. This is of the total population. 27% um, of those 18 to 24 support ISIS. 22, 25 to 34. Ages 35 to 44, only 20%. So the younger you get, the more support there is for this. In Germany, the numbers are a little different. 3, 4, and 3%. For 18 to 24, 25 to 34, and 35 to 44. Sorry for all of this. For the people just listening, this is one of the ones you might want to watch. In the United Kingdom, uh, only 4% of the population as a whole have a positive attitude towards ISIS, 6%, age 25 to 34, and 11% of those, 35 to 44. See, in France, it matters the young people, because this is the people who are going to be growing up with your children, those eight of you who have children. So this, in France, just look at this as millions and millions and millions and millions of people who have a positive attitude towards ISIS. All the result of specific political decisions which can be changed. There has been all of this talk of rising anti-Semitism uh, throughout the Western world. Uh, France actually has the largest Jewish population in Europe. It's about half a million people. But the numbers of Jews in France is 
steadily declining. And if you look at the number of Muslims, right, we've got 10% of the population is Muslim, and this is a tiny percentage that is Jewish. So I would imagine that politicians are more responsive towards uh, Muslim concerns than they are towards uh, Jewish concerns. But if we look at this uh, survey of French Jews on rising anti-Semitism, do you feel under threat? 51% say yes. Have you been attacked? 43% say yes. Have you been insulted? 63% say yes. Do you want to leave France? 70% say yes. And a record 8,000 French Jews moved to Israel in 2015 alone. Now, the number of attacks on Christian sites in France, right, places of worship and burials, increased between 2008 and 2016. The number of attacks on Christian sites in France increased by 245%. Acts targeting Christian places accounted for 90% of all attacks on places of worship. The French Jews, they have Israel to go to. What are your options? Now, a lot of people feel alone in being concerned about these uh, issues. But French attitudes have been fairly well documented. Opposed to the burkini on beaches, 64%. Opposed to the veil and headscarf in public, 63%. Muslim community is a, quote, threat, end quote, to national identity, 47%. Do you favor mosque construction, 13%. European attitudes, unfavorable view of Muslims. Again, this is back to Pew Research. In Hungary, it's 72%. In Italy, 69%. Poland, 66%. Greece, 65%. Spain, 50%. France, 29%. Germany, 29%. United Kingdom, 28%. European attitudes regarding Muslim assimilation. Muslims, do they want to be distinct? Uh, Do they want to not adopt local customs? Is this a perception? Well, in Greece, 78% believe that, or say they believe that. Hungary, 76%. Spain, 68%. Italy, 61%. Germany, 61%. United Kingdom, 54%. The Netherlands, 53%. France, 52%. Sweden, 50%. Poland, 45%. European attitudes, um, the question or the comment, all further migration from mainly Muslim countries should be stopped. Poland, uh, 71% agree with the statement. Austria, 65%. Hungary, 64%. Belgium, 64%. France, 61%. Greece, 58%. Germany, 53%. Italy, 51%. United Kingdom, 47%. And Spain, 41%. Now, the demographic breakdowns, uh, this is by gender and age. So all further migration from mainly Muslim countries should be stopped. That's the question. Uh, Men, say, agree 57%, women 52%. Can be enough to swing an election. And similar to Brexit, we have increasing uh, agreement with this particular statement. With Brexit, it was leaving the European Union and the United Kingdom. So among 18 to 29-year-olds, 44% agree. Um, Further migration from mainly Muslim countries should be stopped. 30 to 44 uh, age group is 50%, 45 to 59, 56%, and 60 plus, 63%. uh, European attitudes. Regarding the statement, refugees will increase the likelihood of terrorism in our country. Hungary, 76% agree. Poland, 71%. Netherlands, The Netherlands, 61%. Germany, 61%. Italy, 60%. Sweden, 57%. Greece, 55%. United Kingdom, 52%. France, 46%. Spain, 40%. And this is with, uh, particularly in France, of course, this is with people working with non-existent or fuzzy data. They don't have the facts. The government is keeping the information even from being collected, let alone disseminated. So you're not, uh, you're not alone if you have some concerns about these issues. 
European attitudes regarding this statement, refugees are a burden because they take our jobs and social benefits. Hungary, 82%. Poland, 75%. Greece, 72%. Italy, 65%. France, 53%. United Kingdom, 46%. Netherlands, 44%. Spain, 40%. Sweden, 32%. Germany, 31%. European attitudes... Regarding the statement, refugees in our country today are more to blame for crime than other groups. Agreement, Italy 47%, Sweden 46%, Hungary 43%, Germany 35%, Greece 30%, United Kingdom 28%, Poland 26%, France 24%, and Spain 13%. Now, just by the by, French law requires anyone who's not a naturalized French citizen if you're convicted of a crime, you lose your residency permit and you're supposed to be deported. But basically, the law is rarely, if ever, enforced. Demographic changes in France. In a 1974 speech to the United Nations General Assembly, the second president of Algeria had a dark message for Western countries. President Houari Mohamed Bomadien said, One day, Millions of men will leave the Southern Hemisphere to go to the Northern Hemisphere, and they will not go there as friends, because they will go there to conquer it, and they will conquer it with their sons. The wombs of our women will give us victory. His words were prophetic. In fact, a significant amount or proportion of Muslims in France are of Algerian descent. The Imam Mullah Krekar said, We are the ones who will change you. Just look at the development within Europe, where the numbers of Muslims is expanding like mosquitoes. Every Western woman in the EU is producing an average of 1.4 children. Every Muslim woman in the same countries is producing 3.5 children. Our way of thinking will prove more powerful than yours. More recently, a top imam told Muslim migrants to breed with Europeans to, quote, conquer their countries. Imam Sheikh Mohammed Ayed said, Europe has become old and decrepit and needs human reinforcement. They are not motivated by compassion for the Levant, its people and its refugees. Soon we will trample them underfoot, Allah willing. Throughout Europe, he said, all the hearts are enthused with hatred toward Muslims. They wish that we were dead, but they have lost their fertility. So they look for fertility in our midst. We will give them fertility. We will breed children with them because we shall conquer their countries. And migrating to spread Islam to foreign countries is considered a praiseworthy act among uh, many uh, Muslims. So, of course, I understand that the uh, quotes that I just read do not necessarily represent the majority of uh, thinkers uh, in any particular demographic. However, however, there are still important considerations to think of. First of all, Western governments, for God's sake, stop blowing up and bombing and destabilizing other countries. For the love of all that's holy, can you stop playing tin soldier around the world and trying to create Jeffersonian democracies from cultures which have very little history uh, with this kind of thinking? Stop going in, stop bombing, stop destabilizing, stop funding, stop it. For God's sakes, these are human beings. They're not pawns in some geopolitical oil hunt. Stop it. But given that it's happened, there are basic realities that need to be understood. You don't have the right to fundamentally change your country. You, don't, you inherit your country from your elders, from, from people who fought and often bled and died to build and to maintain the culture that preserves and protects you and your children. You inherit your country, and you must pass it to your descendants, hopefully improved, but at least more or less in the same kind of shape that you received it. You know, we don't poison everything on the planet because our children are going to have to live there. We borrow the environment, as the saying goes, from our children. And we borrow our cultures, our countries, our ways of thinking from our children. Now, this doesn't mean no immigration. Of course, wonderful. I mean, I move around the country, so... I've moved around the countries, never particularly by choice, but, you know, it's just the way it worked out. So it doesn't mean no immigration. But if people come to France, one hopes that they come to France because they like France. In which case, if people put all the time and effort into moving to France, going through all the paperwork, jumping through all the hoops and moving to France, because they like France, 
you don't really have the right to change fronts for them either. Like if I go to a French restaurant, I don't want to sit down and order Chinese. I go to a French restaurant because I want to eat French food. And people move to France because it's French. So don't change it. Even for the immigrants who come who value France, you don't have the right to change it for them and you sure as hell don't have the right to change it for your children. The question of radicalization, the question of increasing alienation from the dominant French culture among certain immigrant groups, this is a problem that needs to be solved. And just continuing with more and more immigration in the absence of trying to figure out why this problem was occurring and what the hell is happening is to my mind beyond irresponsible. And it is going to rob France of its essential character for the immigrants and for the native population alike, which is a crime. And you don't have the right to do it, in my humble opinion. It's okay to love your country. It's okay to love your history. It's okay to love your culture. In fact, it's pretty essential. We're tribal animals. We know that. Take pride. Protect. Defend. Maintain. For God's sake, get out and vote for the right candidate.